All right, so we are ready to start. Um, today, uh, we have a great pleasure to, to have Professor, um, Professor Altair from Federal University of Berlinja. Uh He's gonna talk about the dense ring around the TNO core outside the rot limit. Uh, Professor Altair got his major in astronomy in Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. At the same university, he got his master and PhD. Um, later, it is what uh, he finished his PhD in 2018. Um, then he went to for a postdoc at NASP from 2018 to 2022. Uh, and that same year, 2022, he got this position at Federal University of Berlinja. I think that's right. Okay, okay. So, yeah. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to have you here one more time. So the microphone is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Altair. I present this work, which is based on the paper that we published recently on nature. As you can see, uh, this is a co collaboration with many people. So the, the first author was Bruno Morgado. It's a professor uh, at UFRJ, uh, Valongo Observatory. Uh, he led this work, but I collaborate a lot. So the, it, this is a dense work, and that's because we have what uh, this many people here. Uh, okay, so this work is based on the discovery. It's about the discovery of a dense ring uh, around a TNO named Kawar. And this ring is, is located outside its rush limit. So for those that didn't understand any word, I will explain everything about it on the presentation. So first of all, what are we doing? So uh, our group is, uh, is a collaboration. They study the small bodies in the solar system, mainly the ones located far from the, the sun, which is outside the orbits of Neptune, for instance. And these are called TNOs, trans-Neptunian objects. Uh, these objects are very important because we can also understand how they, uh, how they uh, are made, their physical properties, we can understand or constrain some uh, history of the solar system, how the solar system formatted and how it evolved. So that's why we studied this object. Power, for instance, is a TNO. It is located at uh, 43.5 astronomical units. So uh, further than Pluto, for instance, which is 40 astronomical units, it is classified as a QB1 which is just a name based on the first object discovered in this region. Uh, so it doesn't mean much being could be one, but it's just based on the, the name of the first object that was found. Uh, this is, Kawa is one of the big five TNOs. So the TNO region is located far uh, outside the object of Neptune. Most of these bodies are large, or many bodies are large. Pluto, for instance, is, was thought to be a planet for a, while, uh, for a while. And we have Eris as well, that is by basically the same size of Pluto. And here we have uh, the 51 called Kawar, and it's about, uh, it have a radius about 500 kilometers. So it is basically twice the size of Ceres, which is the largest body on the, on the main belt. So, uh, Kawa has a satellite called Wayward and is orbiting in the same major wakes of about 26 Kawa radii, which is an important information. Uh, and Kawa mass was estimated based on the orbit of Wayward about this value 1.2 to 10 11, uh, elevated to 21 kilograms. Uh, Kawa's rotational period is estimated to be about 8.8 .8 hours or 70.6 or hours, which we cannot confirm at the moment because, uh, because of our data cannot uh, have two possible solutions. But this is also important information. We believe it is probably 17.6 hours uh, of rotational period. 
So why we do study, should we study Kawa? First, it is a dwarf planet candidate. It is one of the five largest TNO that we know to now, half the Pluto size. Uh, its size and shape that it show, shows uh, that it's possibly in hydrodynamic equilibrium, so it's basically a round object. We cannot say for sure that we, have, we haven't observed Kawa uh, by itself, but we have some data that can constrain some of the, uh, its shape. For this object, there, is, there are four from the solar of the sun. Uh, they, they, these objects, they preserve much more their characteristics from the, from the formation of the solar system because they are very far from each other. They do not have much collision. They are far from the, from the sun. So space weather is less effective than in the inner objects. So it preserves its characteristics for much time. Because of this, this is an important object to study. If we understand its surface composition, its interior, if it is differentiated or not, it would give us hints about the early solar system. Differentiated means that a body can be, have a core and a, and a, a crust. So it has some uh, gradient of density in this body. Usually small bodies does not have this differentiation. Okay, so Kawa is an interesting object to be studied, but how can we do it? So uh, Kawa is located very far, as I said. If we compare the apparent size of this, uh, of this distance body, we can see something like this. Pluto has a size about uh, uh, 60 milliard seconds on the sky. So this is the angular size of Pluto. Eris have about the same size of Pluto, but it's farther, so uh, the apparent size is, is smaller. The size of Eris is the same as we imagine uh, one real coin at about 220 kilometers of distance. If we see the largest space telescope that we have so far, the James Webb Space Telescope, the size of the pixel uh, of uh, our image of, uh, of James Webb is about 30 by 30 milliard seconds. So all of Eris, for instance, would fit inside one pixel of James Webb. So we cannot see Eris, for instance, very uh, with all its characteristics. Koala is a bit larger, but even so, it would be two to three pixels in size. So even so, we cannot uh, characterize Kawa by direct imaging. So what we do is study by stellar occultations. This is the main technique that my group uh, utilize, uses. So the technique is based on a similar characteristic as an eclipse. When a solar system body passes in front of the star, we see that the star will be blocked depending on the position of the observed because the light will be, uh, this light block will cast a shadow on Earth. So an observer here in this map, for instance, on the US would observe for some time while this object is moving, the star disappear. And if he measures the light of the star a long time, we have a light flux and it is more or less like this. We see the light of the star with some noise. And then when the body passes in front of the star, we have a drop in the light flux for some time and then we have the light of the star appearing again. Uh, if we know the position of the star and the position of the, absor the observer, we can constrain a, a line, a line of sight, and put these positions when the when, wherever the body was located, when the occultation happened and the star uh, appeared again. And we can just draw these positions, this instance, as a relative position on sky. When we have many observers spread on Earth, each observer will, will observe different light curves with different size and different uh, durations in the occultation. So if you combine all of these observers, we can fit, as we can see, more or less uh, the shape of the body. 
This image is not for color, it's for another object that we observed. The green line is the relative position of server, object, and star. The, the observer did not see the light of the star uh, changing. When uh, the star was in this position relative, relative to the observer and the body, the occultation happened, and during this blue uh, period, the observer did, uh, did not see the light of the star, so it was occulted. As you can see in this case, we can constrain most of the shape of the body, given some uncertainties in this instant of uh, occultation. And in this case, for instance, there this is another object, you can see variations in the shape of the body. For instance, here, uh, a crater that we detect. But this is not Kawa. Kawa is another uh, body, and we did not have to, did not have many charts as we have for this one. So this is a stellar occultation. Usually you have uh, the apparent size in 2D. We cannot see uh, 3D shape. We have to make, to observe many stellar occultations to construct the 3D shape of the body while we rotate it, for instance. And the apparent shape will change of, uh, on time. But usually you have only uh, uh, 2D shape, as we can see. For this work, as we so we had to uh, have many observers spread on Earth. So because of this, we have a large collaboration uh, around the world. These uh, red dots are all the observers that also collaborated with us in some campaigns, uh, observation campaigns. So we have many observers in Europe, we have many observers in the US, some uh, in the South America, but Almost none, I would say, in Brazil, given our uh, large area. We have some observations in South Africa and Australia and New Zealand. But still we have a lot of region on this map that we are not covered. And we cannot choose when the shadow will pass. We have here only two eight. And if the shadow pass in the sea, we cannot uh, observe the occultation, even if it's an uh, interest uh, event. Uh, to, to organize all these, we have many collaborators all over the world. We have some groups that lead, that lead this, this work. And we have the Luxstar collaboration that is led by these three people. Uh, a French group led by Bruno Sicardi, the Brazilian group which is led by Roberto Vieira Martins, and the Spanish group led by José Luis Ortiz. Uh, also, if you cannot observe from Earth, we also try to observe some events with space telescopes. Uh, up to now, we got detections with two space telescopes, the Keops that observed a Kawa event, and the James Webb, which observed an event for another body. So we also we have a collaborative collaborative effort. We collaborate with many citizen astronomers. So these are uh, astronomers, they are not professional per se, but they have, they make uh, professional observations. We, they, they buy themselves some uh, equipment, telescopes, and they do uh, observational by love. And they make observation that, with quality and they share with us these uh, their data. So with, this, with their collaboration, we can observe uh, stellar quotations uh, as the one that I uh, showed you with many uh, observations of the same body. So this is very important. Even with the small telescopes, we can observe stellar quotations. It only depends on the bright of the star, because if the star is bright, we can see with the small telescopes. And once the light is dropped because the body passes in front of it, we can detect this uh, drop in light flux. We also use large telescopes, which is important because we have more uh, signal to noise ratio in the data. So we have more details about the occultation. They, they will be less noisy and they give us more constraints uh, in, for instance, in materials around the bodies. And also the space telescopes that I show you, 
we, for the moment, observe only three events with space telescopes, two with KELPS and one with James Webb. We also have time for more uh, observations, some of them uh, in May next, next, uh, next month. Okay, but uh, we observed so, uh, some stellar occultations about uh, of Kawa. What we detect? The first one is this one. When we have a star that is blocked, which, which like is blocked by a body in the solar system, usually we observe this star, but we do not observe this body because it's faint. And the light flux drops basically all the, the light flux of this star. We, if for some moment we, we do not see this star anymore. This is what we expected for Kawar as, as well, because Kawar is very far, and it should, we should not uh, observe some light of Kawar from, from the occultations. But uh, in some occultations uh, that happened in 2018, we observed, we observed some drop in the light flux that did not go to zero, but it was only a small portion of the, of the light flux of the star that was blocked. And this uh, occultation lasted for about two seconds only, that given the velocity, the velocity of the body would represent on the sky about 13 kilometers. And as I said, Kawa is about 500 kilometers in radius. So this is not what we expected to observe in a stellar occultation by Kawa. So we have a hint, we have a hint that there was something close to Kawa. This could be anything, for instance, a double star. So in this case, we had two stars that were close to each other, we did not see there was double. So only one star was blocked by Kawa and the other was not. So we did not see the flux drop to zero. There was a possibility. But it could be another one. An interesting, an interesting feature is that this position that happened, it was, as can be seen here, can be seen here, about 500 seconds for the instant of occultation expected. And given the uncertainty of the position of Kawa, it was very strange for the occultation happen in this moment. In, uh, after that, in 2019, I guess, the, uh, we have other campaigns, other observations. In this case, we observed the occultation drop to zero uh, caused by Kawa passing in front of the star, as can be, see, can be seen here. And it was close to the zero seconds that we expected. But uh, looking careful in the data, we also see some drop flux in this region that is shown from here in uh, zoom, and in this region. You can see first that they are almost symmetrical, about uh, 160 seconds uh, far from the expected instant, and they are different from each other. We have a uh, occultation here that happened for a small instant of time, but it, was, it had a, a large drop, about 10% of the light flux, and another drop in the light flux, there was around 3% only, but it was larger in time as well. So we also saw another thing that was interesting, but we could not say for sure what it was. Uh, this observation uh, was made with the Grand Telescope of the Canarias, that is a, a big telescope, and it had a very low signal to noise ratio. As you can see, we can uh, see details around 2-3% uh, from the light curve. Uh, the goal was to observe atmosphere, because if, uh, uh, if Kawa had atmosphere, the light, the light of the star would refract on the atmosphere, and we could see instead of a drop, a abrupt drop here, we see a smooth one with the light curve uh, it would start disappearing slowly if the if Kawa had an atmosphere. But what we detected was something else. Uh, there is some difference between the detection that we observed before 
and this one that we observed in this moment. First, we, there is two detections which are different from each other, and the instant of occultation is also a little bit different. Uh, in 2020, we observed a uh, stellar occultation by the Space Telescope Kelps, as you can see here. Uh, this line, blue and red one here, shows the path of the shadow over Earth over time. So this black dot uh, is the center of the shadow. We can imagine that the shadow is a circle around this, this black dot. And it goes in this direction, from, left, from right to left. And this point is the center of the shadow separated by one minute. So we can see that it's very fast, the occupation. Kelps was orbiting Earth following this movement uh, given by, uh, by this uh, red line. And we see the position of Kelps also separated by one minute on space. So he is at 1622 and he 1633. Between uh, 1627 uh, and 1628, uh, Kelps that was observing this star also detect a drop in the light curve. The light curve. So you observed this occultation. Uh, the, the instant uh, of occultation was observed when Kelps was around this green uh, line here. Obviously, it does not fit well with all this shape. We can see that the yes, Kelps comes in this direction. It was in this part of the orbit when Kelps was, when the shadow was like this. And then uh, as, the, as the shadow moves, Kelps uh, goes outside the shadow and the shadow was like this, more or less. So that's what happened. We also had some observations from Earth in Australia by Jay Broughton, and he observed uh, in this location, and he did not see the star disappear. So what uh, we can see is that it was outside the shadow, so it was a negative chord. I have here the light, the light flux of the star over time. What's interesting here is the Kelps uh, had a very low signal, uh, sorry, a very high signal to noise ratio. So we have less noise in the observation. This is important. And this is uh, because Kelps is outside uh, Earth. So it does not have, uh, it does not worry about the atmosphere of Earth, which causes some noise in the observation. So because of this, we have high quality signal to noise ratio. We also saw the drop on the star. As we can see here, we have some intermediary points, but this is not due to the to atmosphere. It's more because of the duration of each image uh, obtained by Kelps was about three seconds, so about 60 kilometers in space. So each point represents about six kilom 60 kilometers in space. But even so, it Kelps, we also detect a very small drop in this region and in this region. It is a one point drop, but it's a one point drop that is larger than a three sigma dispersion of the light curve uh, of the light flux of the star. So it's, it's, it is an important drop. Uh, I collaborated most of my work in this observation as I worked mainly with this position of Kelps. Okay, so the, the paper that published this occultation was also by Bruno Mogad, who was led in the work by Kelps, but I collaborated in the technical part of including the observations of Kelps to be analyzed together with, the, uh, with uh, Earth observations. Uh. Okay, in 2021, we also saw some drops in this uh, the light curve of uh, an occultation. In this case, it was three detections in Australia. These, obse these observers did not observe the, the main body, but he, obs he observed uh, some very significant drop, as can be seen here, in the light curve. This is much, much larger drop than we saw before. There was about 5-10% of the light flux. 
here we have around 90%. And also very far from the instant that we expected. So the flux does not go near zero in this case. The quartz, which is the size of this drop in space, is about five kilometers in the sky plane. And we can only see one clear detection with the light curve. So there was three observations. We saw in these three, three observations the same drop in the same size, but we did not see the other one. And this suggests the presence of something around Kawa. To combine all of this, we try to draw the, these locations where these drops happen on space relative to the position of Kawa. So the first one, 2018, was a drop that happened around this region in a position relative to power. In 2019, it was these two drops and the drop caused by the main body. In 2020, you have the observation by Kelps and the one by the, uh, by the ground-based observation. So he did not observe the main body, but he observed a drop and we could draw these positions in one space. And the last one, they observed only a drop in one position. It's clear here that we can draw a ring around Kawa to fit these four observations, these four occultations. But it's not easy to see when we only have this point spread on space because in some, ca in some cases, we also have errors in the acceptance of the position of Kawa that we cannot just uh, eliminate uh, in the occultation if it does not observe uh, the main body itself, for instance, in this case. Uh, and because of this, it's very difficult to really get that that is something that fits, for instance, a ring. And that's what uh, gave us uh, the publication. When we look at, at these four occultations, we could detect a fit uh, ellipse that matches all of these detections. The problem here is that it's some, for instance here, that did not detect anything. But the problem here is because these observations were much noisier, and as we saw in some cases, these drops was very small. So it could be that in this case, the ring was not enough to block the light of the star for, uh, with light, uh, with, with a, with a large drop, okay? So what can we see? We have a ring. This ring is located about in the plane, in the equatorial plane of the body, which is given by this uh, geometry here. And it has about 4,000 kilometers of radius. So the size of the ring is about 4,000 kilometers from the main body. Okay, so we discovered a ring around Kawa. This is very interesting because it's the seventh ring, uh, ring system that we know so far. The, the first four ring systems that we discovered were around the, main, uh, the largest planets. So Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune have rings. In 2013, we discovered a ring uh, around Cariclo, which is a small body as well, about 120 kilometers of radius, which is the first uh, ring detected around a uh, uh, small body. In 2017, we discovered another ring around the dwarf planet Haumea, and this is the third ring around the small body that we discovered, it's around Kawa. So we see first the ring is become more common, while 10 years ago, we only knew rings uh, around planets. Now we are knowing rings around small bodies as well. So these have serious uh, implications, uh, dynamical implications, to understand how these rings form and how they evolve to survive for a long time in the solar system. For this, uh, the, the ring of, Ka uh, of Kawa, first we have a global structure. Uh, these detections it shows a circular ring around Kawa with a radius of 7.5 Kawa radii. So the ellipses they we saw were just projection because it's a ring, 
is a circular ring, but given some uh, projection on space, we saw as an ellipse on space. The, we determined the polar orientation of the ring based on this condition, and we saw uh, its polar orientation is close to the polar orientation of the orbital, uh, of the Weyot's orbit. Weyot is, the, is, the, is called a satellite. So, Weyot has a pole, is, is orbiting Kawa in a elliptical orbit, or circular, I don't remember exactly. And the uh, orbit of Weyot is not very well constrained as well, but we know about uh, this plane of orbit. And we know that this uh, ring is also in the same plane, or very close to it, uh, of the Weyot's uh, orbit. We also obtain some physical, uh, some structures, local structures. We saw in some occultations a very uh, large drop, and in some others a very small drop and wider. So we see that this ring is not uh, uniform along it, uh, its longitude. So we varies in longitude is right irregular. So we have some narrow parts and dense and some other less dense in wider regions. We can understand this as this ring being collapsing in some region that could be uh, accreting, or it is something like we observe in the in natron's ring. There is some uh, small regions that will have a rightly concentrated uh, material density, and this is usually because a presence of some satellite close that constrain or keep the material uh, in some region on the ring. Uh, we see that in the in Atron's ring, so we could have something similar to Ikawa. But we are trying to understand the, the rings of, uh, of Kawa based on like eight points on sky. Okay, if they uh, have these characteristics, what could uh, we understand? So, Kawa's ring uh, has a norm normal optical depth ranging from 0 0.004, which is very transparent, to 0 0.77. So, it varies a lot the density of material, of material uh, around, the, uh, around the ring, depending on the longitude. This implies that the Kawa's ring particles suffer between on and t collisions per revolution. The mass of the ring, based on data available, we can estimate the ring have a mass about 10 to, uh, to 14 kilograms. If accreted into a single satellite, this would yield a body with a radius of the, in the order of 5 kilometers. If all of the mass in the ring would accrete before and form one body. Okay, but there is something interesting to analyze. Uh, when we uh, understand or study rings, we must uh, understand how close this, this ring is from the main body. For instance, uh, with the planets, these rings are located very close to the planets, while the satellites are a little bit far. Because, uh, because there is some limit that we can we call Roche limit, that if a material like a satellite comes nearby the, the body, we have a gravity that is very different inside the body. We can see that it's a, gra a gradient, uh, uh, the gravitational force. So the force on the, the part that's closer to the body has uh, is suffering a larger gravitational force than the region that is further from the body. Uh, this is the cause of tides, for example, in, on Earth. So the gravitation, the, dif the difference in gravitational force caused by the Moon caused these variations, this elongation of the, uh, on Earth. The, the water suffers the most, and we have an uh, elongated Earth that is caused by tides. So it, this is a, a tidal effect. When a body comes too close to the main body, when a satellite comes too close to the main body, this difference 
uh, in the gravitational force is larger than the self gravitation of the the body. So the self gravitational is not enough to keep the this body uh, as a single one. So it disrupts, it breaks, and all this material starts to revolve around the the main body and form a ring. The same can be said if this ring is for some reason expelled outside the rush limit. Once it, it is outside this, this rush limit, all this material would accrete and form a single body. So we define this as rush limit. It is not exactly a, a limit because it depends on some characteristics. It depends on the mass of the body, the semi-major axis of this orbit, the density of particles, and also some parameter that is based on the, the shape of the main body. So depending on the density of, the, of this ring, for instance, it could uh, be allowed outside this Roche limit. Usually for the main, uh, for the planets, this is around 2.5 uh, radius of the body. Okay? And the uh, ring that we observed with uh, with Kawa is very far from this Roche limit. This is a comparison of this Roche limit for the planets and the small bodies that we know. So we have here the body up to scale. So we have the same scale uh, in size of the body, as you can see. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. This uh, yellow line shows the Roche limit. So you can see that it's a little bit different, different from each body. For the planets, for instance, in Saturn, we have some rings that it, it is outside this Roche limit, but these rings are kept, they are very uh, well known because there are some uh, satellites that work as shepherd of the ring. So it keeps the ring constrained. It does not allow the ring to accrete and form uh, another body. Uh, we also have something like this for Uranus, but we did not see that for Jupiter and Neptune, for instance. For Haumea and Caracol, there we already know there is a ring. For Haumea, the ring is inside this Roche limit. For Caracol, it is outside, but this is a very uh, is debated because we don't know exactly uh, what is the mass of Caracol. This is a value estimated based on this color, on this color, and uh, orbit. But Kawa is too far when we compare in this example to the other planets in scale. So it's very it's very far from what we expected the ring to be. In the case of Kawa, if we estimate the density of the ring to be around 400 kilograms per cubic meter, it should be around this region, while the ring is close to this one. We could obtain a density, a, a ring in this region, if we assume the density of the ring to be 30 kilograms per cubic meter, which is not what we observe. We observe a ring which is very uh, or much denser than this one. So we have to understand what's happening. So just to be clear, this rush limit is not exactly a limit, but it's an indication of limit. And something, sometimes we do not have the exact value because we do not, do not know the mass, the densities of these bodies, and so forth. So we have a dilemma in this case. Uh, under the density ring particle, so to have, uh, to have uh, a ring with 30 kilograms per cubic meter, but with enough sizes to block the light of the star, as we see, these bodies should be like a, a fluffy material, like you've never seen before. So it should be large and very, uh, uh, a very low dense, uh, density. It could be a very young ring, so a ring that was formed by the breaking of a uh, uh, of a satellite, so it is revolving around the body. But we, this kind of ring in this situation, usually after some years, 
would accrete again into a satellite. And this process it usually takes a few decades if uh, it is a, a, a ring that is uh, existing for some time, they will accrete in the uh, satellite, it accretes, it accretes very fast. So what we see, it would be a very rare situation given this, the, the, the time of the solar system, the, the age of the solar system, to us observing a ring outside this Rush limit, they will be accreted into a satellite. This is like a, a game in the lottery, or even much difficult. Uh, or the Rush limit is not a limit. We have still to revisit this kind of uh, study to understand if there is some conditions that would allow the presence of a ring that would exist for longer time that is not constrained by the models that we know uh, of ring uh, accretion. Okay, so key factors that we need to understand is the velocity dispersion. So the ring has some velocity distributions of these particles and the velocity dispersion of the ring particles may be high enough to prevent particles from accreting efficiently. Uh, in these cases, some things should uh, exist to understand. Uh, some ex external fa factors, so the dispersion to be higher, it should have a resonance with some other uh, satellites, as happens in the in Saturn, as I said. And this resonance could be with a mean, as a mean motion resonance with wayward, uh, the satellite, or could be an uh, external factor, uh, the, the material, uh, the uh, internal factor, sorry. The material is not, the, cannot uh, accrete even with the small uh, velocity dispersion. So the particles coefficient of restitution would avoid accretion in this case. However, this alone does not explain the confinement of the ring. So even with these two uh, uh, conditions, it is, it is still very difficult to explain the existence of the existence of this ring. So, to understand a little bit more, the standard factors with unknown satellites, there could be some satellites there, as I said, as a shepherd, a satellite close to the ring, two satellites mainly, two, one outside, one inside, they would prevent this object to be, uh, this ring to be uh, accreted, but we cannot observe, we did not know, we do not know this object, and it's, <laughs> It is, it is difficult to observe, even with James Webb. It could have a mean motion resonance with wave. What mean motion resonance is, for instance, if the ring is orbiting, uh, it takes some time to make a revolution around wave, uh, around Kawa. Wave, its satellite, have an orbit that is proportional to this period. We know that it is about, at the moment, in the mean motion resonance 6 to 1. That means that while a particle in the ring revolves six times around the Kawa, a wave would revolve once. And these uh, proportions uh, create some resonance uh, in, the, in the orbit. And this causes a uh, disequilibrium, let's, let's say uh, variation velocity dispersion on the bodies that, is, that have a small, uh, small mass like the rings. We also can have resonance with the spin of Quawar. And depending on the rotational velocity of Quawar, for instance, Quawar is orbiting uh, three times around its axis, the ring is revolving uh, uh, once around Quawar. This is called spin orbit resonance. And given uh, that I said in, in the beginning of the presentation, we have two periods for the, for the rotational period of Quawar. One of them uh, is close to this 3 1 spin up the resonance. So it could be one of the responsibles for keeping the presence of the ring. So we are more likely to believe in these two situations in case of a stand of factors to the ring. Here is a, for instance, 
what we can say about them. The six one mean motion resonance with the with the orbit of Kel, of Weyland, but it is located around this region in green. And the one tree resonance, uh, spin up resonance, is located about this region. So the ring would be located in the middle of two resonance. So this is a very interesting situation that we do not see for the other rings in small bodies because on the others, we do not know exactly the satellites. For instance, character, we don't know if there is any satellite. So this is very intriguing. To study the internal factors, we uh, analyze, you know, we search for some laboratory experiments to understand and obtain some coefficients of restitution to, to see if there are some models that would allow for the, this ring to exist, to exist. So in this case, we only compare two models because as a, 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 we do not want at this moment a, obtain an exact model to for this ring, a specific ring, but we, want to, but we want to understand if there is some model that would allow the ring to exist, okay? So we have compared two models where we have here the coefficient of restitution, which is based on different temperatures of the material and the impact velocity. So what we do is to distribute uh, many particles around uh, in a region. It's a anybody simulation. And we simulated about 2,000 particles. This was made by the collaborator, Heik Salo, uh, in a region about 160, per, per 160 meters. Uh, typically, uh, we made simulations that last for about 300 orbital periods. And what we see is this. We have here the, the coefficient, and uh, here the orbital period. Uh, sorry, the period that it is orbiting. So one period, one revolution, two revolutions, the number of revolutions. Using some simulations, we saw that depending on densities, there are some densities that survive for, for about 300 orbital periods, while others, they survive for 200 periods and basically very fast, accrete into a body. So this is what happened, for instance, uh, in all these six uh, graphics here, it show only a small region in here. In the orbit 185.3, we had uh, a, a ring. In the uh, orbit 189.3, we had a ring. In the orbit 189.8, less than one orbit, we already had a uh, of a uh, satellite forming, as you can see here. And then the satellite increased and accreted uh, in size. So this happens very fast. To try to understand, uh, we use that mod, the, those both models to, to in this kind of simulation. And we were increasing the, the density of particles to understand when this uh, particles would accrete. So using the model of bridge 1984, if we used a uh, 60 kilograms per cubic meter density of material, it would survive the 300 orbits. But if we increase the material for 90 kilograms per cubic meter, this, uh, this ring would accrete into a satellite. So the ring would not survive 300 orbits, which is very small time given the, uh, the, the age of the solar system. But if you use the model of Hatsi 1988, we can still keep a ring with, if you give a density of material of around 500, 5,000 kilograms per cubic meters. If we increase the density for, to 6,000 kilograms per cubic meter, uh, the ring would accrete into a satellite. So here we have some model that would allow the ring to survive even with large densities of material. So as I said, this is not, we not say that the, ring, uh, uh, the rings have materials and coefficient of restitution 
based on hats at all, but we are saying that there are models that would allow the ring to exist. So in conclusion, uh, we see that uh, since that the Roche limit is not exactly the limit, but there are some things that we have to understand to really uh, comprehend what's going on in ring uh, formation. So to conclude, after this publication, I've submitted this paper to Nature, we also had another observation of occultation in 2022, August 9. Uh, this occultation passed in, in the US, so we had many observers. And we have two large telescopes to observe, uh, the Gemini North with 1.8.5.1 meters in diameter, and the CFHT with 3.6 meters in diameter of the telescope. So there is a very large telescope that we can try to observe the, the rings with more details. This is another paper that already, was already submitted because it has, a, it has a very interesting analysis of the, of the ring. We have here this which is called continuous part, but it's the, the, the wider part of the ring. And here, the denser one. As we can see, in this case, we have many points during the ring, so we can see more or less how is the density variation, uh, the, the density variation uh, in radius of the ring. We also had some interesting things that is included in this publication. For instance, here, in this point where is my mouse, we can see a small drop. That is, if you look at the, this graph, it is just one point uh, below the, the noise, but it's very important. And we also estimate that there can be another ring here in this region, which is about the half distance of the ring that I just showed you. So it is possible that Kawa has another ring. Okay, so what we learned from this work First, there are many rings in small bodies. We now know three rings around, uh, three ring systems around three minor bodies. There is a possibly four, which is Chiron, but Chiron is a bit problematic because uh, Chiron is, uh, it has some ejection, some material ejection, which is caused because it has some cometary activity. So it has some ejection, and this ejection causes some material around. Uh, the body and sometimes it forms a ring, but this ring does not necessarily have to exist for much time. But we already have observed some material around Chiron. Uh, obviously, uh, if existed more rings in the solar system, it will be around small bodies because all of the large bodies we already know. Uh, the Roche limit is not the limit. We have to understand uh, uh, more uh, how this, uh, this material aggregate, aggregates or accretes, uh, how, uh, this, how, uh, how is the composition of these particles and other information. Uh, so this is a question that, do you think you know Kawa? Because Kawa uh, has been observed by stellar quotation since 2011, but we have never observed these rings until an occultation 2018. So we need more uh, better equip equipments to observe these uh, occultations that are usually very small, cause small drops to detect a ring. So we, we need to study these objects that we already have observed with stellar occultations. Because sometimes we, are, we just didn't have signal to noise ratio enough to observe the, the ring or other materials. So. The collaboration is key. As I said, we, have, uh, we need the main collaboration to observe these stellar quotations. And because of this, these papers, these publications usually have a lot of people because they include uh, scientists, citizen astronomers, technicians, and others to do this uh, large uh, work. 
And thank you. This is just an uh, image uh, that showing more or less what would be the power ring with a large density of material in one place and then being wider but less dense material in the other place. And we have Hikawa and he would be the satellite we want. So that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Atair. So the, the seminar is open for questions. You can have a question even from the audience or in, in person or online. Uh, Henri, can you take care of people? Any question from the audience over there? You are muted. You are muted. No. Okay. Any question from the audience online here? Uh, um, I I have uh, I have actually a list of questions. I I may make few. Um, so uh, first, um, uh, uh, thank you and, and, and for for this nice uh, talk. Uh, I'm not really familiar with this uh, uh, research, not even with astronomy. So my my question may be really uh, naive. Uh, so uh, if you if you find so naive, so apologize about that. So it's, uh, this is stellar occultation. This technique uh, is, as I said, it's, it de it's depend on the star behind the object you are you are looking at, right? Yeah. So so um, so it's it sounds to me that really lucky you have right below. Be behind the object you want to look at uh, as a specific star and the relative distance between the the object and, and re relative to the Earth and the star apparently is important too, right? Yes. So when we have these stars, they are very far, obviously, but we have a lot of stars on the sky. So if we imagine uh, that each star casts a shadow because the, the, the object is blocking this star in some direction. We have a lot of shadows uh, on space. Uh, these occultations are quite, quite hair, but uh, it you depend on the body, on the velocity of this body on the sky. Usually for these bodies that are very far from the sun, we have about two, three stellar occultations. The, which shadows passes on Earth by year. Uh, these occultations are sometimes involve uh, stars that are faint, so we cannot make many observations. Sometimes it is uh, uh, more bright stars. So th this is a kind of luck, yes. But that's because why, uh, that's why we make uh, an exploration. We study many bodies in the solar system, and we, when we do that, we have occultations that is happening uh, frequently. And if some occultation is interesting, we can uh, observe this uh, that event and see if there is something interesting. In this case, we observed some around Kawa. Uh, for instance, I worked with stellar occultations by satellites uh, of Jupiter, so some outer satellites of Jupiter. Since Jupiter makes an orbit ar uh, around uh, the Sun in 12 years, so it passes in front of many stars uh, uh, <laughs> along a year. So when I make predictions, uh, there was one year when, the, when Jupiter was passing in the apparent uh, plane of the, of the galactic plane. There we have about 300 occultations that we could observe in one year. Main, most of most of them was uh, with the faint stars, but there was a very large number. When the Jupiter was far from this region, the occultation was uh, decreases to about twenty. For 
these objects that I'm talking in this presentation, this is usually about three, uh, five, maybe, stellar occultations per year. I could show you here, let me see, as an, as an example. This is a portal where we make public all these predictions. And we have here the predictions for many bodies. So in these cases, it's a Trojan asteroid. Uh, it happens. It happened today, this morning, to 2 a.m. And it passes in a region that we could not observe. And I don't know if you can see the, the map here. So on on the on the on the ocean, we had another Bicari clone with a star 15.1 and brightness, and it passes in the north of Africa and as well. So we have a lot of occultations for many bodies uh, in one day. So we have to choose which ones mm -hmm. are the most interesting for bodies that have conditions to, to have satellites, rings, atmosphere as well, and others that could give us another information for another part of the solar system. Mm -hmm. For instance, the Trojans give us a hint is about the region uh, of Jupiter. So we have many occultations because we study a lot of uh, a lot of bodies uh, at the same time. Good, thank you. Um, uh, John, we had a question. Is he wrote a question on on the chat? Can do? Can you see? On the chat, sorry. Yeah, I can read if you, if you want. Yeah, that's right. How is it possible to estimate the quantity of collisions among the particles in the rings? Uh, this is about the, the density. This is a probabilistic uh, estimate. We have the velocity dispersion, which has to be around a velocity that would not make the, this particle escape from the gravity of Kawa, so it must be uh, in some constraint in that region. And this basically the, the, the number of particles that could exist in the region. So it's a, a, an estimate based on these uh, conditions. That's why when I showed that, it varied between one and 10 collisions per year. I don't remember exactly where, uh, here. So depending on this optical depth, which would give more or less the number of particles in the region, we could estimate it uh, around one collision per, per revolution. If it's larger or more dense, you could estimate 10 collisions per revolution. So it's a st statistic estimate. I cannot say exactly the equations at the moment, but more or less like this. Oh, okay, I mean, along this, this question, or the zombie question, so um, I'm concerned about the number of collision, collision uh, 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 per, this is collision per uh, revolution. So, yes. so the number of collision per revolution uh, would be determined to, uh, for, for, uh, for the formation essentially of the ring, right? If for very, uh, very few collision, we imagine that this ring will be spelled um, more uh, quickly. Is that right? Uh, oh. well, if the re the collision is is less, uh, these materials will not accrete because we need exactly. the collision yeah. for the ring material to accrete. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the formation, I don't I don't know for the formation. The formation we believe the ball could be a satellite that breaks into uh, when it. Mm -hmm into this ring when it entered the region of uh, Russian limit, or it could break as well because of some collision with another satellite, with another consequence. But uh, to these collisions is important for the exist, for the survival of the ring, mm -hmm. not for mm -hmm. its origin, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, that's what I want to say, uh, the yeah. survival. Yeah. 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 But, but, but by the way, along the same line, where do these materials come from? From from outside 
to, to start the formation of the thing or from the flower itself? Uh, so when the ring formate, uh, yeah, we don't know exactly where do come from this material. Mm -hmm. We it could be from uh, from the formation of the solar system. Uh, some material could accrete uh, from the gas that formed the solar system could accrete into a body that form power, and some of this material that could revolve around power, gas, and dust would accrete into a satellite, for instance. And this uh, satellite, in some moment, if it gets inside this region, it could uh, break again into the ring. Mm -hmm. Or it could, uh, while uh, Kawa already existed, some of this dust that was closed uh -huh. in, in the beginning of the solar system, there was more dust and more uh, gas, this material could form a ring around Kawa as well. But if it formed at that epoch, how could the hell could it exist until today at this distance? That is what we do not understand. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a little bit of balance and between right. where this, uh, uh, how this body, this ring formed, and if it formed in a region that could exist until we observe or if you are uh, just an uh, occasion of uh, observation and this ring are uh, accreting into a satellite and in some years we will not see the ring anymore. I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Any question from the auditorium? No? Um, I'm, I'm afraid I have uh, maybe my last question. <laughs> I'm sorry about it. It, the topic is so interesting, and I know very little or nothing about it, so I, I have many questions. So, in in, in terms of simulation, you, you have you shown a simulation. So, since it is like a, it could, since depend on the the density of materials, you could think these material are like a a, a, a grain a gas, right? in which you could simulate with some sort of Navier-Stokes with some dissipation term. Or you do like, uh, or different like particle to particle, or you simulate each particle itself. How, how can you, can you explain a little bit? Okay, uh, this simulation first was made by Hake Salad as he's expecting this kind of work. What, as far as I understand, he, uses these uh, 2,000 particles, so it creates like a anybody simulation as well. So mm. like small gravity forces between these bodies and when they collide, they would accrete and form a small body that would collide with the other and uh, follow suit. So this is, as far as I know, uh, what he did. So he makes some square region with uh, 2,000 particles this region, you could say that is open, but when this object passes from, it is moving this direction, it appears in the other, like simulating that is a, a small region uh, inside a very large one. So mm. it would accrete, uh, it simulates like it always has 2,000 particles or the size of these particles, the, the length of these particles. And then they would accrete colliding with each other and the self gravity keeping them together. So it is uh, anybody's simulation. It look like a molecular dynamics, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. If there is no other question, uh, uh, last chance for the, the audience in the auditorium. No? Okay. I think Professor Otta, you'll be around. So if you have uh, further. Uh, comment or question, I think he'll be happy to answer. So once again, Professor Tai, thank you for your nice talk and congratulations for the recent publication. Thank you. Okay, see you. Bye-bye.